Uh, I'm Dominic, Dominic Hayes. I'm from the European Commission. Uh, and maybe those of you that don't know, the European Commission is the executive body that's responsible for um, uh, Galileo. Uh, the European Commission itself is, is like the civil service of Europe uh, or the civil service of the European Union. And the European Commission is one of the institutions of the European Union, uh, along with the European Parliament and the European Council. Um, and the European Commission is the, if you like, the strategic and political direction for the Galileo uh, program. In fact, it's not a Galileo program anymore. It's actually an EU space program. And Galileo is one of the components of that sp space program. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm required to give this statement uh, because uh, I work for the European Commission. And when we attend the conference at which Russia is present, we are required to give this statement. I won't read it out, but I will say that the EU, along with its like-minded friends, will do what it takes to ensure that you can, Ukraine can determine its own future. Next slide, please. So Galileo today is composed of 28 satellites in MEO, MEO orbits. Uh, it has outstanding performance, and I'll, the next slide will show the performance. Uh, we have a number of operational services, and we're rolling out some new services in the coming years. The most recent of which is the high accuracy service, and that was declared operational last week, in fact, our commissioner, Thierry Breton announced it at the Brussels Space Conference. Um, and so that was, uh, that's the start, we hope, of a very successful service. And I will talk about it, talk about it later in the presentation. Uh, we have a very strong link with our users, um, also the market and industry. Um, and I emphasize users because it's all very well having a satellite navigation system but if you don't have users, there's no point in having the system in the first place. So we have very strong links with our users. Um, and despite having a really successful satellite navigation system up there, Galileo, we are working on the next generation. Next slide, please. So this is the slide I, I, I mentioned that talks about the performance. So you can see here, um, it, the green arrows at the bottom there show the the signal in space user range error. Um, and we are, if you look at on the right hand side, you see the constellation average, the green arrow there, it's around 20 centimeters. Now this is the ranging error from the satellites. Now that 20 centimeters has been quite consistent now for the last few years. Um, and, and it will stay around that, maybe improved slightly. But you can see from the, the other back, yeah, you can see from the other the other uh, systems there that we are actually very competitive compared to the other systems. So we think we actually have the the best performing satellite navigation system. We we may need to work on reliability. Still, we are still working very hard on that. We had a an outage several years ago. Um, we're working very hard to make sure that doesn't happen again. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we have a number of services, and this is the portfolio of our services. So we have the open service. That's the one that most of you will pick up on your smartphones. Um, we, that open service is available on three frequencies. So if you have the right equipment, you can actually pick up three Galileo signals and do something called trilaning using the three frequencies. And we're continually improving that performance. And we're introducing a new uh, service uh, next year, I think it is, going to be declared operational. This is the Emergency Warning Satellite Service. And again, I'll have another slide on that later on in the presentation. Uh, we're also working on new features for the next generation, advanced timing. And as Jim mentioned in his presentation, we're working towards the SSV, def SSV definition for, for the Galileo system. So that will mean that you can use Galileo in orbits uh, from the geo downwards. Uh, we have a public regulator service, which is available for EU member states. It's a robust and encrypted signal uh, for governmental applications. 
Um, we have the search and rescue um, service. Um, that is part of the COSPA SARSAT system. It's been operational since 2016. It's saved many lives over the years. Uh, that's using the forward link. So that's the link from the beacons, the, the distress beacons back up to the satellites and back down. We also have now a return link, which is operational. This is where a beacon can receive a message from the rescue coordination center to say that the rescue message has been picked up. So if you're in a sinking ship, uh, this will give you some hope that help is on its way. And we have um, three additional features coming to the search and rescue service. So we have the, um, the RBA, which is the, uh, I'm trying to remember the acronyms now, um, remote beacon activation. So this is where an authorized authority can activate or request to activate a beacon. So for example, if you remember a few years ago, the MH, uh, the, the Malaysian Airlines uh, aircraft that went missing, it had turned off all its transponders. In this situation, if an aircraft was feared lost, uh, the airline could request that the beacon be turned on, be activated. And in that case, you could actually track the uh, aircraft through this remote beacon uh, authentic, uh, activation. Uh, we have TWC, which is two-way communication. So this is where messages can be sent from the beacon to the rescue center. Messages such as I'm sinking or um, uh, life, uh, I've got a, um, someone who's in, in danger of um, uh, dying or as, some predetermined message that could help the rescue service. And then we have the DPS. This is where, this is a direct position sharing. So if you are on a ship that's maybe quite close to where another ship is sinking, that could actually be activated and be given the position of where there is a sinking ship or any other uh, um, emergency. And if you are closer, you could potentially get to that beacon before the, re the official rescue services. So this is another feature that we think will, will save lives. Um, I'm gonna talk about the high accuracy uh, service a bit later, but we've also got authentication. Um, the open service navigation message authentication is coming soon. And then we are also working on uh, the advanced signal authentication services. So that's using the, the third frequency, the Galileo E6 frequency, uh, it will be an encrypted signal, not quite as uh, robustly as encrypted as the PRS, but it will be encrypted so that only registered users can uh, receive authenticated uh, position fixes. And then we have the safety of life contribution, which is uh, working with the other systems to provide ARAME capabilities, both from Galileo satellites and also through our, also through our EGNOS system, which is the regional uh, SBAS system that covers Europe. Next slide, please. So this is our roadmap for 2023. In fact, it's a little bit out of date already. You can see from the third bullet there, declare service for high accuracy service. Well, we've already done that. I mentioned that. We've done that last week. Uh, but the other things we have on the, the roadmap, the to-do list, if you like, for 2023, is to consolidate the constellation uh, to ensure that we have at least one spare satellite per plane. Uh, we also want to complete the ground segment this year. Uh, we also want to declare the open service navigation message authentication uh, in service. That's, that will be coming very soon. Uh, and we planned a public demonstration campaign for the uh, emergency warning satellite service, EWSS. And we're also going to be publishing documents to update all of the services that we we have we are providing. Next slide, please. So the high accuracy service, our, our newest service. So we've actually been transmitting the signal for quite a while now, and it's it's been in test phase. But last week, as I mentioned, we've declared it operational. Um, it provides orbit and clock corrections for the Galileo signals. So E1, E5A, E5B, and E6. But as well as that, it provides corrections for the GPS, L1CA, and the L2C signals. So it will be providing corrections for all of these, and you can combine that with the information you get 
through your regular satellite navigation, uh, satellite reception, and you can get a more accurate position fix down to around 20 centimeters. Um, in fact, I think we can go even lower than uh, 20 centimeters, but 20 centimeters is what we are advertising. Now, the key thing compared to some of the other um, high accuracy services that we've spoken about during the conference is, is that this one is coming from a, a Mio uh, constellation. And compared to a geo um, PPP correction, you will get the convergence time on your device more quickly. So typically from a geo, I think I've heard figures of about 30 minutes for, conver for convergence uh, once you pick up the signal. For the Galileo Haas service, we're looking at a conversion time of around three minutes or so, which I think is very good. There are a number of LEO PNT systems coming along in the future. Uh, when they come, that will improve that even more. So I think you'll get um, uh, fairly fast um, position fixes, high, ac high accuracy position fixes in the future. But obviously, this is what we are doing now. It's operational and it's something that we're very proud, very proud of. Uh, these PPP signals, the corrections, are provided free of charge um, using our third frequency, the Galileo E6 frequency. And I have to say now, one of the things I'm working on is at the World Radio Communication Conference, uh, which is this, this year, later this year. It's an international conference where we modify the radio regulations. One of the things we want to do is, is get additional protections for E6. Because at the moment, it suffers or can suffer from interference from other services in the band, notably the radio amateur service, which is a secondary service in, the, in this particular frequency. But it's something that we think is very important. If we're going to use this for a uh, service in the future, we need to have a reliable reception. So we want to improve the uh, regulatory protection for E6. And we know that Japan... Uh, a QZSS uh, community is very supportive of this uh, agenda item for the conference. I just wanted to mention that. Um, the corrections will also be provided over the internet. And uh, actually, this provides some very interesting possibilities in the future. I was speaking to a colleague um, and I said, well, does that mean if you have a handset that can pick up the internet, but it's only got one, one GNSS frequency uh, that you can get um, high accuracy position fix? And he said, potentially, yes. So I think this opens up the door to uh, a lot of opportunities for uh, PPP corrections to, to handsets. He did say that you won't get the full benefit of uh, the triple frequency uh, performance boost that you get from the PPP provided by the satellites, but it will be a high accuracy service better than you can get with just the GNSS on its own. Next slide, please. Uh, ne the next service, which is coming very soon, is the OS NMA, so Open Service Navigation Message Authentication. Um, it's long awaited. I've been talking about authentication for many years, but now it's finally happening. Um, we've had the ICD for the OS NMA out for several years, well, since uh, November uh, 2021. Uh, the signal itself has been transmitted stably on the E6 one, sorry, the E1B signal. Uh, well, over a year now, because this slide is slightly out of date. Um, we anticipate this service to be declared operational in the first half of this year. So certainly before the summer, you should see OSNMA. Um, we know that there are some already receivers on the market, so it's you know, manufacturers are waiting for this to arrive. It's, the, it's going to be the first authentication feature of any GNSS system. So I think it's going, and again, opening up a new potential market. Next slide, please. The emergency warning satellite service. So this is something uh, that we've, created in response to the UN's national, sorry, UN's United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Program. Um, it will enable an on-demand broadcast of alerts and guidance to those populations at risk from natural disasters. 
Um, and a, an alert can be activated by an authorized national civil protection authority. Um, we plan some demonstrations of EWSS um, this year and service declaration uh, next year. Um, we've joined forces with QZSS to develop a, a message structure. So a common message alert format that can be used by QZSS, Galileo. We know that uh, NAVIC is also interested in using this and maybe other systems as well. So that's a uh, thank you to my colleagues in uh, the cabinet office for helping us to coordinate that activity. So we need to make the most of that now. So we need to share and promote this common format um, in international forums, but also potentially not just satellite navigation forums, potentially this, this could be a message format that could be used in other uh, emergency warning um, channels, potentially through uh, terrestrial uh, means, for example. We need to demonstrate EWSS to show that it's actually a realistic system. We need to involve actors and engage those civil protection authorities that will be the ones that are requesting the activation. Next slide, please. So we have a strategic vision for Galileo. It's to maintain excellence and resilience in provision of navigate, satellite navigation services. Uh, so we need to make sure that Galileo can evolve. We need to make sure that European industry is competitive in supporting Galileo. We need to make sure that in, in Europe, we have no weaknesses in our supply chain. So we don't rely on any, any one um, avenue for enabling Galileo, whether that be within Europe or outside Europe. We need to identify backup and complementary PNT solutions. They might not be satellite. Um, 5G, um, 6G, maybe Leo PNT. These could all be potential backup options for GNSS. We need to support market adoption. Um, Galileo is now in two, over two and a half million billion uh, uh, devices worldwide. Um, we need to make sure it's it's that continues uh, and that it's adopted in as as widely as possible. We need to make sure that Galileo is a, a leader in in segments where it can make a key contribution. And we need to ensure Galileo's leadership in space, N not just Galileo's, but the EU's. I mean, we are, I think, one of the the leading. Uh, nations along with um, the US, uh, China and Russia are all leading in space. We need to make sure that continues both in through international cooperation and through uh, bilateral discussions. And we need to make sure we're in the mix for the very latest technology that's being used in GNSS. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we're not stopping there. So the next generation of Galileo, which we are calling shortly G2G, um, that's just the, the short form being used at the moment, uh, will offer new signals, faster acquisition, more robustness, the, the capability to be reconfigurable. It will have orbit raising capability on the satellites, inter-satellite links for robustness, and we're having additional onboard clocks. We've seen how key uh, the atomic clocks on satellites, on sat satellite navigation satellites, are really crucial. And um, it's not not a secret. We have had some problems with the atomic clock, so we we realise that's a key uh, a key facility that we need to keep and improve on on satellites. We we will have a number of uh, slots, onboard slots for experimental equipment. So uh, potentially. We can add new features to the satellites as they're being rolled out on the production line. So it, it won't require a complete redesign of a satellite. We can slot in potentially a new feature. Um, the current satellites, I think, have a, a, a lifetime around 12 years. We're looking to extend that to 15 years with the next satellites. Um, I mentioned that they will be flexible uh, to be reconfigurable, and that's to really adjust to market demands as the as the markets develop. And all of that is supported by our strong R&D program under the, under the EU's Horizon Europe program, which supports these developments. Next slide, please. I think it's the last one. Yeah. 
I know that there are some countries within ASEAN that are looking or considering to build an SBAS system. But I'll, I'll leave this thought for you. I think SBAS works best with cooperation. When we built EGNOS, we built it with the cooperation of all the member states of the EU, even though some of them could have done it themselves. Australia and New Zealand cooperated to build the South Pan system. The African Union is now working to build a Pan-African SBAS, again, through cooperation. So I think as ASEAN should also consider cooperating to build a regional system. And you can talk to me or talk to some colleagues back in Brussels uh, about um, how you can achieve that. Thank you.